And uh, I'm the chairman and founder of TBA 21 and co-founder of TBA 21 Academy. And I really am extremely grateful for this opportunity given to us, extended to us by our code to participate and to curate a series of round tables for this afternoon, which I hope you will enjoy. I hope you've had time to see the fair in the meantime. There's wonderful things to be seen. So we've actually taken this opportunity to create a safe space um, where we can imagine together how we can, how important it is to give artists a voice and how important it is to support artists in their practice but also in their lives and their commitments to the urgencies of our time and how they wish to express it through their creative processes. With more and more artists from around the world taking up this banner, taking up this challenge, towards making visible all the systemic injustices that have been very much exposed by COVID, but that are appearing more and more around the world. And by bringing their creative practice to explore some of the most urgent topics of our time, and sometimes some of the most explosive ones, some that are even too big for us as individuals to possibly comprehend. These are social and environmental issues that we're addressing today. Also, as we have changed our program, a political one. TBA 21 has engaged in this practice since very early on. We founded, we were founded in 2002 and already in 2004, we embarked on our first commission, Cuba, ironically, uh, by Kudlu Gataman a Turkish artist, which this work focused on the plight of some Kurdish uh, villagers in a small community outside of Istanbul. And the importance of their, they felt of their identity, of their language, of preserving their culture in what was then a complete takeover by the city of Istanbul as it grew from 9 to 14 million inhabitants. Later on this year, uh, this work will be included in the permanent exhibition and rehang of the permanent collection at the Renia Sofia, as we donated this work to the Renia Sofia. And it's incredibly important for us that this recognition of such work and the beginning of our practice of addressing art as an agent of change, which has really forged our path and the way we have been approaching most of our commissions and co-productions over the years, which now number nearly 300 works. We'll start today with the Academy, TBA 21 Academy, which is celebrating its 10-year anniversary today, this year. And this talk will address the importance of work with the ocean advocacy through artistic practice, and new language for policy making. It's moderated by the director of the TBA 21 Academy, Marcus Raymond, and next to me, the wonderful Chus Martinez, writer, and, well, you are a writer, curator, and professor at the Academy of Art and Design in Basel. And Barbara Casavecchia is a writer and a curator from uh, Venice and Brussels, no. Venice, Milan, Milan, sorry, sorry, sorry. And Rosella Biscotti, who's also an artist, who's going to take my place, um, who's an artist from Rotterdam in Brussels. <coughs> so, at TBA 21, we are dismayed at the targeting of artists' freedoms, particularly during the brutal coup recently in Myanmar which has seemed to seek to silence journalists, voices of poets, writers, artists, and journalists in that country. We are even more dismayed by the recent imprisonment of Hamlet Lavastada, last week on his return to Cuba. And as TBA 21 profoundly supports those artists whose work contribute to peace and tolerance, 
through their artistic freedom. This is something we must fight for in a world which is rising in fundamentalism in many countries. And it is absolutely our pleasure to have made some uh, rearranged our program today in order to be able to include um, a panel by Marco Castillo um, as we are committed to <coughs> sorry, peace and tolerance. So Marco Castillo brought together a panel at three... Sorry, I have to... <coughs> <coughs> I have a dry throat. <clears throat> Don't worry about my coughing. It's just very dry. <coughs> so this, co this conflict, this um, conflict, this <laughs> talk will be at three and it will be curated by... Uh, a new curator, TBA 21, Sofia Lemos, um, with Marco Castillo, Cuomitoc, um, no, 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 excuse me, I don't want to get this name wrong, Cuatemoc, thank you, Cuatemoc Medina, who is chief curator at MUAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Mexico, and Gerardo Mosquera, <coughs> writer, critic, and curator from Cuba. This is a very important talk, and we look forward to all of you um, being part of that. But it's also maybe a hard turn afterwards, but it's important to create a space for poetics as a subversive gesture to open up political discourse. So please stay for our last panel at 4.30 with Chief Curator of TBA 21, Soledad Gutierrez. Um, so we'll talk to two wonderful women artists that actually were part of our new online platform stage, which stands for S Streaming Age. Um, it was a platform that was set up at the beginning, at the middle of last year, in order to support artists and independent art practitioners who believe in art as an agent of change, first of all but also in order to protect the immense cultural loss that was about to be happening if, if all of these organizations like ourselves and others didn't make a special effort to reach out to artists in their independent practices during this pandemic and during the COVID-19. So I'm really, really hopeful that you will, some of you will stay on for this last uh, panel because we have two wonderful women artists from Spain, Asuncion Molines Gordo. She's a researcher and an artist who has a wonderful show at Travesia Cuatro at the moment. And Himali Singh Soing, uh, who's a wonderful writer and artist and activist from um, India. She'll be joining us online. So there's a bit of a hybrid between people that will be here and uh, online. So, but thank you all so much. And I very much want to thank Maribel Lopez, who gave us this incredible opportunity and to create this safe space here at ARCO. And Ana Alvarez, who coordinated all these round tables with us. Thank you so much for your flexibility and all these last minute changes. And I really want to thank everybody from TBA 21, Carlos Uros and the whole team, uh, Soledad, Elena, uh, Noelia. Thank you all. I have a wonderful team here in Madrid. It's growing and an incredible team of people. So thank you all for now. I'm going to zoom off and let you get on with these wonderful talks. Thank you so much. Marcus, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesca, for this uh, fabulous introduction. Um, and also for the inspiration and the courage that you, that you bring to our practice and allow for these spaces to be created within the organization that carries your name. And I think this is, this is uh, incredibly courageous nowadays to do something like that. Um, I hope you didn't try to correlate the, the images that you saw to what Francesca said because this was a test run for Rosella's presentation and had nothing to do with Fra what Francesca said. But um, 
As Francesca mentioned, I'm the director and co-founder together with her of TBA21 Academy. And coming, being born out of TBA21, we're clearly a contemporary art organization, but we like to think of ourselves also as a cultural and creative ecosystem that um, aims to foster a deeper relationship to the ocean through the lens of art to inspire care and action. And now you can say, well, when you come out of the contemporary art world, why do you care about the ocean? Um, there's a number of very easy um, uh, um, natural science facts uh, to that. The ocean cover covers 72% of the planet. We, every other breath that we take comes from the ocean. Here come our colleagues, Daniela Zeman and Sofia Lemos. Um, but, uh, but also in the kind of situation that we find ourselves in right now, in this, what has changed from climate change to climate crisis and maybe climate catastrophe, what we're following right now as we see the ocean burning, the ocean is our biggest and best ally in mitigating the effects of climate, the climate crisis. And so, 10 years ago, we embarked, always together with artists, um, to ask ourselves the question, what is the ocean? And how do we relate to it? How do we live with it? Um, and in the beginning, this was an open-ended question. It was a, a relatively unstructured, uh, meandering uh, pursuit and process until a number of years later, we came to the understanding that this actually needs a format. We had, uh, we had uh, met a number of friends, we made uh, uh, colleagues with scientists, we had uh, legal experts in indigenous leadership joining us. And this um, gathering and these coming together um, needed some kind of format. For the past 10 years, um, we were situated, the program was situated on a boat a 39-meter explorer vessel called Dardanella, where we invited artists and scientists, um, environmentalists, legal experts, and so on, as I said before, to come together for times of two weeks, intense times of two weeks, to live with, in, and on the ocean. And from there, we started thinking. From there, we started imagining. From there, we started working. Production of artworks in the beginning was never... Um, a factor. It was not about producing more objects, it was really about being together, about being on the ocean, about thinking with the ocean and from the ocean, and thinking with and from change. But what happened was that the urgencies around the ocean um, became more and more apparent. Um, ten years ago when we started this, plastic was already in the ocean, the oceans were already rising, the, ocean, the acidification was rising and everything was already happening. Very few people were talking about this. And, um, and in the art world, it was very seldomly addressed. Um, so we were met with a certain kind of skepticism when we embarked on this. But as I said, uh, a couple of years later, we started formulating this and the first program that we formulated was The Current. And The Current is a three-year fellowship program. At the time it was a three-year fellowship program, now we've changed the format a little bit, where we invited guest curators to lead these three-year cycles to go on an annual journey on the Dardanella and bring five people, ideally from different disciplines together, to engage with the places and communities that we were visiting under certain curatorial aspects that we had discussed beforehand. But the underlying story was really how to, how to build friendship, how to build relationships, and how to communicate and sense the issues around the ocean in a different way. As I said, making objects was not, the, um, was not the incentive. So within six months after these journeys, we came together again in two to three day performative conferences, happenings of ideas, uh, multi-formatted and multimedia conferences to, give, to, to, um, to present the questions and findings that were arising on these journeys to an audience, but to give as many entry points into these topics um, as possible. So it is everything from children's workshops to keynote speeches to performances to screenings to poetry readings and so on. 
leader of this cycle was Utamit Abba, who uh, was Utamit meant to join us later this, uh, this day, eh, but uh, sadly can't join us because of the time difference to, uh, to Singapore and no previous commitments. Um, but I'm very happy that I'm joined by Chus Martinez, who took over the, the leadership of the current for the second cycle. Um, and within that time, uh, there were a number of questions that uh, became more and more apparent. Questions around the carbon footprint of the program, questions around the ethics of visiting, um, and many others. And so, over the last two years, we were thinking, how can we reformulate these, uh, this program, and how can we restructure it? And as I said, we, we decided to abandon, we jumped ship, we abandoned the boat already last year during Chus's last year of, uh, of her leadership, um, and we needed to find a new format. So the last year of Chus's um, leadership of the current already turned digital, um, and uh, there was a series of micro-commissions sensing the ocean from afar, from places of confinement and so on, it was Ella Biscotti, was one of these micro-commissions. After that, um, Barbara Casavecchia took over, and she needed to deal with a new format, and the new format is now dissolving the three-year cycle into a five-year cycle and weaving three streams together, the first stream has started this year uh, with the Mediterranean, it's a collaborative research project, um, uh, creating networks around the shores of the Mediterranean and finding um, a different narrative than uh, the most deadly border on the planet or the, or the cradle of Western civilization for the Mediterranean. Um, next year we'll start a strand in Oceania and the year after we start a strand in um, the Caribbean. The idea is to weave these three bodies of water into conversation with each other. And at the end of every cycle, every third year, there will be an exhibition at Ocean Space in Venice starting next year, starting the year after with Barbara, because um, Chus is currently uh, curating a two-year cycle coming out of the research that she did for the past three years. Um, this year we have Taloy Rabini from Bougainville, uh, the autonomous region of Papua New Guinea. Later this year we will have um, uh, Isabel Lewis, and next year we have a fantastic program with well. But with that, uh, Chus, I'm going to come with you. Ah, and here is Rosella. Y también tenemos a Rosela Hello. ya. ¿Qué tal, Rosela? Can you hear us? ¿Nos escuchas? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Sí, Fantastic. os escucho. Great. Um, Estupendo. Good. Hi, Muy bien. welcome. Bueno, pues bienvenida. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Y muchísimas gracias por venir. Um, Chus. I'm going to come to you first, voy a empezar contigo. Uh, as you have all also Puesto worked with Rosella, but I come to you first with, con Rosella, um, y how did you approach cómo, uh, this program, has which was este still kind of finding its way, when we extended the, the invitation camino, to you, cuando te invitamos, being, um, teniendo en cuenta from, que from the, from the coast, but tienes, not bueno, really es verdad, the ocean not really being your topic. El océano no es tu área de, de, de investigación, es más bien de la parte costera, pero ¿cómo encontrar well, ese camino? Bueno, debo decir que es un privilegio de recibir esta invitación, ser partícipe en un programa que su objetivo es en realidad ser partícipe en un programa que su objetivo es en realidad ser partícipe en un programa que su objetivo es en realidad ser partícipe en un programa que su objetivo es en realidad ser partícipe en un programa que su like in reflecting about what I did, I came about two elements that they were very important to me. One is the production of a space, which is a book that was published in 1980 by a French philosopher Henri Lefebvre. And he's talking at that time about how space is produced. And he talks about it, uh, giving us examples, the fact that a constructed space, so urban space, um, has the possibility of being perceived as something very concrete, as a place where culture happens, but also transcending uh, the functional part of a space, we may encounter the possibility of a communality, of, um, as a space that's political because of the encounter of many perceptions and experiences of the need of a space that belongs to all of us. And um, it's very funny because we think that that expression, the production of the space, is something that exists forever, but it didn't. I think it was the first one. Coining it. In the same year, uh, 1980, 
Gaston Bachelard, que quite, la creó, uh, late in his career, published another book, publicó otro uh, which libro, is called The Psychoanalysis of Fire, of fire del fuego, and where he's trying to analyze an element of nature, fire, um, de este in a psychoanalytic way. Del fuego, so trying to understand um, a natural Estamos element under the parameters of culture. En base a and los then, um, de la I've humana. been thinking when you invited me, okay, we are talking pensaba, about vale, vamos space, when espacio. we talk about the ocean, but we normally talk about about the other space of the culture, de de and we also uh, take for granted that this other space for culture is going to be mapped. So it's going to be studied and it's going to be, uh, you know, observed. Eh, and the tools and the language of modern science. And that the way that modern science is going to analyze is going to then uh, produce some sort of, of an effect tanto, in, the, in the space of culture. But what if we take that reflection Pero of the commonality of an experience that we need to take together uh, to the ocean, and we conceive that the ocean is also a public space, it's also a space for art, and then of course the way that uh, we should then be interested in how art and artists interact with this space is similar to the psychoanalysis of fire. It means that artists um, Quiere decir que el artista, they don't go a diferencia de otras disciplinas, no va a este espacio con intencionalidad. Del mismo modo que el fuego no quema cosas de forma uh, intencionada. No plantea, uh, vale, voy a destruir still, o voy a darle um, calor. No, no lo hace, and simplemente es. Pues es un poco el mismo concepto, una experiencia que eh, nos permite ver el espacio como algo público, porque la comunidad lo vive, también es público para los animales, para todas las formas de vida, que habita um, en ese espacio y también es público para los que no están conectados en absoluto con el océano. Pero a ver, ¿cómo podemos ampliar esta imagen tan abstracta y compleja y al mismo tiempo aprender a producir un lenguaje, una filosofía, una mutualidad y también una experiencia que puede tener, por lo tanto, un, un impacto en esa experiencia sistémica a, a del world mundo that is artístico que conocemos basado principalmente en las colecciones, en los patrimonios artísticos, and, uh, las exposiciones y espacios expositivos, so, que lo que hacen es eso, mostrar piezas de arte. ¿Qué podemos aprender del océano para poder modificar nuestros sistemas actuales? ¿Cuáles son los métodos que podemos desarrollar para poder descentralizar estas ideas que tenemos sobre las acciones directas que ejercemos sobre la naturaleza y también las acciones directas que ejercemos a la hora de pedirle a las comunidades, a las instituciones, a que hagan cosas que esperamos de ellas? No para mí. Three years of study, Fueron tres años de estudios um, espectaculares en los que descubrí so cosas I, que no sabía. Yo sabía que los científicos querían uh, artists, trabajar con so artistas, pero no era consciente so so de que nosotros también tenemos uh, mucho que aportar. No es tanto como que um, la ciencia nos presenta al mundo de una manera que nosotros podemos ilustrar, sino precisamente lo contrario. Nosotros le damos a la estructura científica que a veces no tiene la sensibilidad de la colonialidad el género that are so important o el lenguaje, que son tan build importantes a la idea de crear ideas de una política de una comunidad um, una comunidad and política, we actually are y que primordial no for the direct primordiales research, but no yet solamente para for la investigación of, uh, principal you know, sino para la vernacular inclusión and indigenous knowledge de los into the corpus of study but also into the methodologies of study and into the distribution of those um, information about our planet and the urgencies of the planet um, all around so en todos um, as i said I think that it is dicho, very fertile si to bien, work with, uh, with these communities, and it has been, of course, especially interesting to be able um, poder to have a space like the ocean space, which is kind of a roof for these many communities that you put together, that you invite, and then try to, try to create a um, meta community in order to address all these issues from very different points of view and also try to exercise an interaction with education, with the local communities, with the digital um, and with science. So it's, as I said, it has been a very kind of, yeah, fertile process.
talk is around ocean advocacy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's around ocean advocacy. And um, then you can ask yourself, well, if this is about ocean advocacy, why don't you do marine protected areas and why you can't hear me? Now you hear me? Okay, now you hear me back. So what I was saying was that uh, part of the framing of the talk is around ocean advocacy, right? And um, if you think about advocacy, you might ask yourself, why don't you go into marine protected areas? Why don't you do lobbying? Why don't you do all these other things that seem more um, like direct actions, which are spaces that we intervene in? We, we, um, we have become observers at the International Seabed Authority, which is a policy body Around, in, around the governance of the seabed. We are uh, we're advisors to the European Union and the European Commission's project, uh, Mission Healthy Ocean, and so on. But I think the advocacy that we're doing is an advocacy for community, for relationship, for care, um, and more and more for slowness. Now we've started producing um, exhibitions, we've started producing artworks and I think it is important that we provide a different kind of um, possibility of encounter of all of these ideas and concepts, communities, approaches um, that come together to, to work together. Um, but nevertheless, I think and now I'm coming to you, Barbara, because all of a sudden you have to deal with um, a completely different format. You have to reimagine the format of the current without the tool of... Um, the boat without being housed on the ocean, but still f need to find these moments of intensity, of togetherness with a group that you're bringing together, but also proximity to the ocean, which I think is, a, is fantastically important. So um, how are you going about this? I think we still need the... Uh, no. I still... Yeah. yeah. Do you hear me? Ah, now, you do. now you're on. Oh, thank you. I was saying that, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here also in person mm -hmm. after many long-distance relationships. Um, the way I am starting to go about it, because, I mean, my cycle of the current, which is number three, uh, has just started in, in, in January. So I, I think that slowness is really an element of what defines the way I'm trying to bring about this research. Uh, slowness coming from different factors. Um, it's, it's about the fact that the perception of time, if one looks at a space like the Mediterranean or the Mediterraneans, which is probably a way more uh, correct way of framing such an area with all its complexities, it's, it's long durational and it doesn't, uh, I don't know, it doesn't operate very well in terms of speed. It takes a lot of time to build relationships and significant collaborations around that space. It takes time to um, make friends and listen. So the way I'm trying to work around this is also by taking inspiration from a very simple action, which is walking. Uh, last year, I, I came to I mean, my collaboration with the BA21 Academy through the Ocean Fellowship that I had the great pleasure of mentoring together with Louise Carver. And when everything in Venice, which is I mean, the house of ocean space and, and the exhibition venue for TBA21 Academy, when the city was empty and everything seemed to be closed and shut, and, and silence, and suddenly, I mean, the impossible condition that the city is, is usually experiencing with the masses and, and the extractive industry of tourism and all the difficult conditions of the ecosystem around the city, it all became visible. But we didn't have an exhibition space. So because of COVID, everything was still closed. So what can you do when you don't have a physical venue. Maybe you start venturing out of it and trying and find ways for building a relationship with the space around you, which starts from a different point. And so we started a series of walks and, and to, to understand how to be guided through the space outside of the exhibition to, 
to start hearing to a number of voices from the city. And there were voices of activists, of scientists, of artists, of storytellers, of people who knew very well the local history. And this method of just walking together, of sort of uh, breaking also the vertical setting, I would say, the usual institutional setting where knowledge is coming from one place and being shared in also physically <laughs> by a situation which is similar to this one started to change. I mean, during walking, there's no order for conversations and things can, can change at, at a really sort of individual pace. So we, we've decided to learn from walking and also I instead of embarking, we decided to walk around the lagoon. We will do next week with a group of friends and <laughs> core researchers. Uh, the most important thing is that we'll be not only guided, but I mean, we will follow the steps of an artist, uh, an artist based in Venice and Amsterdam, Giorgio Andrea Ottacalo, who was walking as part of his practice. Uh, over, well, over the last few weeks in June, he walked all along the, the, the perimeter of the Venetian lagoon for a piece called La Cuna, which resonates both with the title I mean, Laguna in Italian is the lagoon, but also the gap, something missing, something you're unable to see. And what does it mean to literally walk along the line separating the wet from the dry? And what happens when that line is interrupted, not only by the natural movements of tides, but also by economical interest, privatizations of certain areas and so forth. So, we will try and reproduce for a section his walk together and, and try and see what we learn by sort of situating our knowledge. But we also have here Rossella, which is a natural <laughs> uh, movement, a current herself from the second current to the third current, because Chus commissioned a piece uh, to Rossella for one of the previous iterations, and now uh, Rossella has been at work, and she's still at work on the journey uh, that I would love for her to introduce. But it's a piece that somehow um, resonates with so many of the topics. The, the title of the current tree, it's a working title, as many things. Uh, it's Mediterraneans, thus waves come in pairs, and after Etel Adnan, because it's a line from a beautiful poem by Etel Adnan, Sea and Fog. And in the title of that poem, Sea and Fog, I mean, there's two elements of, of seeing and not seeing, being constantly capable of actually visualizing such an open space, and at the same time dealing with the opacity of a number of conditions. So I think that uh, Rossella's piece which is called The Journey, because, I mean, it accompanies a sculptural element, uh, which is also a sculptural body, which is also a piece of marble, but it's also a presence that needs to navigate across many different and complex spaces, which are sometimes marked by borders, sometimes those borders are invisible, but they're still extremely present. We know that the Mediterranean is also described as a solid sea because of the fact that, I mean, it's really limited and divided and split by all sorts of invisible lines. And sometimes they run underwater like gas pump or oils or cables or some other times it's the fishing regulation some others it's of course the territorial waters and also there's a space which as Chus was saying before is supposedly everybody's space should be a shared space a communal space a space that should be able to allow communication and as we know it doesn't I mean, so please Rossella <laughs> Come and help me. I, I saw that by mistake before some of the images were running, but it would be lovely if you could walk us through some of them so that we can also ask you a few questions. And anyway, thank you for being here. 
and there. <laughs> Yes, we do. Digitally participating again. Um, I I will try to share screen. I don't know if we overcome the technical problem we have, but so please let me know what you are able to see in a moment. And uh, after I I will do that. Uh, probably you will see the presentation as a um, as a full presentation. Um, okay. Um, do you see uh, the image? I don't hear anything anymore now. No. Um, hello? Uh, hello? I don't hear any feedback. Uh, Can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Ah. now I can hear, but uh, but I guess I cannot share my screen. Well, when you, you shared it, it worked. And uh, you could hear my voice as well. We yes. saw your presentation and heard your voice, but you couldn't okay, hear us. Perfect. Yeah, because no, I could not hear yeah. Uh, you. So yeah, they turn our microphone off when you are speaking. So, uh, so just uh, go ahead, and maybe you can leave the microphone on and whilst she is sharing the screen. She can't see me. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a. <laughs> so try again, sharing the screen. Okay. So. Yes. Okay. So we see. I, it. I hear you now, so I think we overcome this uh, problem. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, maybe you will be. Uh, I will do just one test. Do you still hear me or not? Okay, not. Uh, I think I have to keep it like this uh, to be able to hear you as well. No. I know that okay. that image brings us to Malta. Mm -hmm. And of course, maybe you could say why in, in Malta and, and how this project developed. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, I just wasn't hearing uh, uh, the voices. So now I'm, I, I hope we, we manage to communicate. Uh, I just want to, to briefly say something that comes from the, the beautiful introduction you did. And uh, something that struck me about uh, the presentation of shoes and made me think because this is the first time I show images of the journey. This part of the journey that I consider the performance part has been uh, let's say done as a performance in the end of May, so I'm I still needed the time to go out of it and reflect of it on on it. So this is the first time. And um, uh, what I was thinking is, I just thought this performance is composed by various elements. One is a rock that you see. It was introduced by Barbara. I'll I'll uh, go forward and maybe show you uh, the. The rock, I would not call it a block of marble because it's actually an inform, uh, is out of shape, uh, as it's called in the quarry, is a detached extract from the mountain, follow the lines uh, the, of the mountain itself. It's a present, so I will not have extracted if I will not have received it as a present from a prize called Michelangelo Prize in 2010, uh, an old prize uh, uh, from the Michelangelo quarry. So referring really to the location where Michelangelo was extracting his marble, of a block of marble of the dimension I wanted. And of course, I wasn't interested in doing a sculpture, but develop, it for a, develop and use this price for a project. At the time, I was already interested in the Mediterranean area, uh, which I started to explore uh, by traveling. And uh, here I come back to the presentation of shoes, 
by saying that, I mean, I grew up at sea and uh, I grew up in proximity of sea. Uh, I, I know mainly the sea uh, as uh, being a sea, being inside the sea, and uh, through the fishing industry, that is the town where I grew up with. Uh, so for me, it was interesting how at a certain point, and maybe it comes often in my work, I decided to understand why what we call this public space or with this shared space, it wasn't public. Because I think everybody that grew up at sea uh, somehow know that uh, the law of sea is the law that you perform. Because when you are in this element, uh, there, there is uh, uh, you, you work with it. And also part of our journey was disrupted by the bad weather se había interrumpido and, uh, por mal tiempo. Uh, I hear my own Ahora estoy escuchando uh, uh, mi propia traducción. No sé si se va a poder interrumpir, away. si se puede quitar. Uh, so so I, I, um, okay, now, now is better with the audio. Uh, so at that moment I was also, it was 2011 and I started uh, traveling to Lampedusa and traveling at sea. And uh, this photo, for example, is, uh, is a seized object by a migrant uh, boat that I photographed in 2011. And uh, uh, at, at that moment I started to connect uh, this uh, marble uh, and this body of the marble with uh, this sea and thinking of a sort of performance uh, in which I will deploy this marble in the middle of the sea in a way to, and, uh, and I start to map uh, this, uh, this part of the central Mediterranean Sea. So between the highland of Lampedusa, Malta, which then became a location of departure. Uh, Sfax, uh, here you see the, 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 the city of Sfax, so the Tunisia and uh, Libya. And uh, this project took very long. Uh, I will pass maybe to one of the maps uh, that I created in 2016, together with various maps. I started to lay down also on the legal level, what will it be? Can we still throw things in the, in the water, for example? And uh, what does it mean? And uh, can I throw wherever I want? Or do I have to be conscious? So where are things? So we were, Barbara was speaking about solid sea. So the, the fact that there are relics, uh, there are ancient relics, there are lots of relics on the water uh, of Second World War. Um, there, is, uh, there are cables, of course, uh, and uh, um, there, there are geological, very important uh, areas. Uh, there are uh, areas that are uh, a little bit off limits because there are platforms. So I, in a way, from starting from this proximity I had, I start to compile map that will help me out in this performance, in the lay down on this performance uh, that I did in the last May. I'll show you maybe some other maps. Uh, this is one of the last map I compiled. Um, but uh, this is, for example, a map uh, I made also in 2016. Uh, what you see is only the portion of water, the central Mediterranean area, and is basically divided by companies uh, and uh, areas uh, of licenses for gas and oil. Uh, this is a map I call borders, but basically at that time in 2016 are all the military operation that uh, were at place uh, at that moment. And uh, this is one of the last map that tell me in the performance, uh, uh, in the developing of the performance. What you see here is the bigger pink line is my routes, uh, which was not a normal navigational route, uh, but was a route that was following all this research I did and compiling it in one movement of the ship. So moving here, we see uh, following the line of the Tunisian plateau, I did a big research in Tunisia, mainly on the fisherman side. And here on the left, you will not see it in this portion of the map, but on the left, there is the Kerkena Highlands, and there is the Petrofac uh, uh, area. And so I did a lot of research in that area. And I will go back uh, at the end uh, in two weeks uh, to do recordings with the fishermen and activists there. So the, here you see a portion in which the, the navigation was following the line of the plateau. And then at a certain point, the very small red line that you see, a track that is very different in the way it moves uh, is a turtle. Uh, so in this process, I, I basically decide to mainly 
to depart uh, to depart from with this boat from Malta, where I found a lot of cooperation. One of this uh, collaboration was uh, with Nature Trust. Here you see one of the turtles that they save. Uh, they were brought uh, to um, to a center uh, in which uh, they were uh, uh, doing operation on turtles that were full of plastic. That they had. Uh, uh, inside some uh, uh, nylon, and uh, and then and after, after get, get better, they, they will be released, released uh, with, with the tracker. tracker. That, that they, they will, will keep, keep for a certain time, time and then lose. Uh, uh, so, so I follow, follow also part, part in, uh, in my narration. Besides, besides geological uh, borders, there is also Tama, that, that is a turtle, turtle and uh, uh, and is basically also the ship, ship I. I I navigate, I navigate with, with it, which is called diligence, and somehow it became a character on her own, uh, together with the crew and the other people involved, uh, also follow uh, part of this uh, uh, track of Tama. Uh, there are also some stars. What, what you see the star, the star here is really uh, a moment in which, uh, basically, uh, a very important moment in my route in which the track of Tama uh, crosses uh, the Frontex line, and uh, there, there I decided, I decided to, to perform, perform uh, with the ship a uh, circle and then restart with, with the lines, lines that were much more straight and were related to the, to the licenses for us. Um, and uh, you, you see that also, also from, from the moment, moment there is the element, another element that are these little stars here, uh, and these are stars related to the distress calls uh, from migrant, and uh, we selected some of this uh, GPS point uh, uh, together with the uh, Alarm Phone, that is an uh, organization, an NGO organization that collects the call of the migrant to then uh, uh, basically uh, organize through other NGO, the, basically the, the, um, uh, the saving uh, performed by uh, boat ships, mercantile ships, or other NGO ships. Um, I, I, uh, maybe Barbara, if you would like to uh, to tell me uh, how you prefer the narration to go, or I continue by uh, moving towards the uh, the way the journey has been constructed, also through the audio. I don't hear anyone. Hello? Hello? Mm. I'm very sorry, I have communication. It's like ah. these moments. Now yeah. you are connected, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I want to. Finally. Finally. Uh, yes. I wanted you to maybe open up to questions because I think it makes it a bit easier also for everybody to follow part of your process. Yeah. To me, yeah. one of the elements of, of total interest in the journey, mm -hmm. and I know that you are developing a sonic diary of this experience mm -hmm. that will be on uh, the digital platform of TBA21 Academy, which is Ocean Archive, but you're also in the process of then going to Tunis, where for, I mean, an, an extra part of this project, you'll be recording other voices and will also be part of the Tunis Dream CD Festival. Yes. Um, it's, to me, it, it's also the length of this project. It took you so many years to go from the moment where you received mm -hmm. that block of stone which was extracted mm -hmm. from the caves Michelangelo. I mean, the extraction industry of marble, say, initially, mm -hmm. but not only, it's one of the sort of causes of environmental devastation. Mm -hmm. And then you decided what to do with it. W what's the gesture that this material may ask? Is going to be the grand gesture, or is there anything else I may conceive of, of doing with this piece of mountain and then you somehow returned that mountain to the sea mm. from the place where it was coming from. And I remember we were having this conversation, which is, of course, how the long durée as, as a concept around the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. how the possibility of thinking through time, through the space mm -hmm. of the sea, but also everything around it, 
how did it come into play and how many years did it take you to bring this project to the present stage? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's, I mean, these years are, uh, are for me years in which I lay down uh, all this research uh, um, that was mainly to to really like trying to figure out what is what are all these layers uh, that uh, that are uh, or overlapped uh, or inside in the deepness because my idea it was really that this block of marble will navigate and that was it was the experience of this navigation it was mainly a navigation with the mind that was underwater uh, which is of course very difficult to 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 uh, visualize, so and again we are talking about what is visible and what is invisible in this, uh, basically, uh, uh, in the sea and uh, in this uh, body, body of the sea. And uh, this, uh, 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 in relation to the, I think that uh, because of this visibility and visibility for me, the audio was probably the element uh, of representing this, uh, to be able to represent this uh, um, uh, this uh, this journey, because in a way, for example, if you uh, this uh, this is a, a place uh, uh, very important. That was very important to me is uh, a place, uh, and it was the last land that we will see before uh, uh, going out in open sea, and uh, is a place where there is a, a on the island of Gozo where is located a Punic uh, temple, and. Uh, and what we did uh, with, together with the Attila Farabelli, that is a, uh, a field recordist and a composer uh, that works mainly starting from the, the field record action. And uh, we, we basically uh, went uh, inside of the sea and outside of the sea on the coastline to, to do recordings. And in a way, my idea is that uh, this ship, besides navigating on, on top of uh, lines, for example, following geolo geological lines or uh, navigating close uh, uh, to the Tunisian plateau and, uh, uh, in the direction of what, what is, for example, the Petrofac, uh, is like a kind of amplified ear that could hear things that come also from the opposite side. So, for example, this is the image that comes from the, uh, where you see from the Punic temple to the sea. Uh, so if I would have, for example, would have had somebody there with a the camera, he could have photographed our ship passing there. And it's an, it's an incredible location because from this location you overlook from Libya till uh, Sicily. So you, you are really able to turn around and really overlook the whole range of the sea that moves from Libya till uh, Sicily. Uh, so we worked uh, uh, in these two directions really like and also like sometimes uh, trying while BNC to invent a uh, way of recording sound. For example, on the right image, we are in between rocks, but also we use this methodology a few times, like being recording the sound of waves and the underwater. So thinking like how the, the sea is not the only one, is up and is down. And uh, or for example, we, this is the only object that, that will enter this sonic diary and is uh, an amphora that comes from a Phoenician uh, uh, from a Phoenician wreck that has been excavated in, uh, at uh, 150 uh, meter underwater and is it was uh, a complete wreck full of cargo that was coming from all over the Mediterranean. So there was bitumen, let's say, from the Middle East uh, and uh, amphoras that were coming for from uh, Carthage and. Uh, then things produced locally, for example, in Gozo, and uh, it really was span spanning the whole Mediterranean area. But also for me, what was interesting is like this object where the one on the underwater, basically they released in the water their content, and uh, there was mainly wine and honey, and they got filled with the content of the environment that was the sea, but also like in here of sediments. So for example, here in a very conceptual way, we record in the, the, um, uh, the resonance of these amphorans, uh, thinking that in a way these amphorans contain, by the way they are also incrustated with the marine life, they have a particular resonance uh, that 
that is like they are underwater, but they are still containing some of that environment uh, that got stuck in there. And uh, so it's, uh, we have been working in various ways and I don't have images, for example, in relation to the, uh, to the, um, to the Tunisian uh, uh, research, but we have been uh, researching uh, quite extensively, starting from uh, El Ouaria, where there was the tuna uh, industry, and uh, till uh, the Kerkena Highlands, uh, and uh, Gabes, and uh, Sarsik. Uh, and uh, in two weeks, uh, uh, me and Attila will return to Tunisia to do the sound recordings uh, and uh, stay there for two and a half week, uh, weeks. Uh, traveling along the coastline. Um, I don't know if Barbara, this answers your question, and uh, maybe. Um... Thank you. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. Thank you yes. very much, uh, Rosella, for taking us on this uh, journey, which is clearly uh, super collaborative and bringing together so many uh, communities uh, from fishermen to legal experts to archaeologists and so on. Choose. Um, let me ask you, because over the years you also brought together artists and curators, writers, but epigeneticists, you brought in legal experts, you responded to the IPCC report, so through uh, a kind of a scientific analysis of the state of the ocean, the IPCC report on the oceans in the cryosphere. Um, the outcomes are also multitude. There's writings, there's, um, there's kids. How do you how do you, there's not a kid outcome yet, but uh, who knows, but, um, but there's kids programming. Um, how do you bring this together? Do you, we, how does one weave it into a meaningful, now the telephone goes off, um, into, into a meaningful um, uh, continuous stream of, of programming? Or is it more about the multiplicity of um, of voices that are being heard, of the multiplicity of sensitivities approaching the ocean. How do you see that? Well, I think that what I really like about Rosella's performance is that somehow she kind of summarizes and deconstructs the premise of an expedition. So when we were doing an expedition, um, all of us agreed that the expedition was not a name that we can take uncritically. And yet it's so different and so difficult to, it's a, to, to take another name. So how do you name it? It has been historically coined and it has a purpose. That purpose is to observe and to make use of this observation from, for the preservation of uh, our species. So we observe nature, we map territories to protect ourselves. So it has, it has a defensive um, a defensive idea. It has also a linearity. So we want to uh, position the human species in a position of power and in a position of control over the rest of the species. And we need data for doing so. So the expedition is an incredible method to just uh, summarize all these forces. So she just uh, put in the middle of her expedition the idea of it being a performance, this performance being performed by the very history, so the very DNA of history, which is that marble piece. So that marble piece, of course, for us, it determines our relationship with eternity, in a way, symbolically speaking, uh, but also our relationship with uh, our history and how our history would give form to our willingness uh, to produce symbolic forms that would help us to communicate what we want as a species. So by just putting that rock in the middle of the ocean again, she kind of uh, activated all the elements that we know so very well and that we know that, uh, you know, on the one hand, it makes no sense to listen to armed force. It makes no sense um, to reveal the invisible, but it, it does totally make sense to do that. And even science knows that there is uh, these very elements that um, uh, are a fundamental part of the epistemologies of those very close to the seas uh, that they couldn't include because modern science did not allow any space for them. It, they needed to be included. And for us, the, uh, there have been elements of, uh, let's say, belief. So how to include all this um, is a very, very relevant question. So I do think that 
it's not only multiplicity, it's really that it's a coming together that is happening in the artistic practice. And this coming together, uh, it happens every certain amount of times in centuries. So art always had an incredible interest in history. To portray history was a possibility of controlling time. But now we are kind of uh, trying to redefine our very ideas of time and the event. And uh, we do so when we go at the street and we say um, we should stop um, damaging the planet. So that is a claim on history, on the history that we are kind of, the history of actions of the human towards nature. So I think that artists and the citizenship are coinciding. And in this coincidence, we are creating an incredible new public space. And this is the coincidence that I really want to explore through uh, public institutions, through educational institutions, and I think through science as well. Um, perhaps if you would ask me 10 years ago, do I think that art and science can work in that mutuality way together, I would say mm, I'm unsure if science perhaps do perceive us as some sort of decorative, mystical element, symbolic element that they really don't relate to. But now I do think that science also discovered that all those elements that they were forced to live out, they needed to be included. And it's very difficult sometimes to include it through um, interaction or direct inter interaction with certain communities, even with indigenous communities. And they see in art a mediation substance that do allow them um, to enter and to at least produce an idea of um, an imagination of what science needs to change to be able to incorporate what they were forced to leave out. So. Um, to cut the story short, I really don't think that it's anecdotal. I, I do think that, uh, in, as I said, many forces in our society are perceiving a need to address that the event is a transformation of a linear time into a different, let's say, more quantic or more circular time, um, a transformation of the idea of restitution. We see it in the patrimony. We are claiming the restitution of the patrimony uh, to those that we took uh, um, through the colonial imperial uh, process. But the restitution to nature is a similar one. So the, uh, the colonial impulse has been uh, towards uh, territories and people, towards nature as well, and the definition of nature. Uh, we are seeing um, the idea that we need to really grow attentive. We talk about emotional intelligence, but growing attentive to emotions and the senses in no less than growing attentive to putting a microphone and listening to the, to the ocean and the sounds it produces, because we know that it is life and that in recording and producing a sonic experience of it, we are expanding our very idea of our own internal organs and the possibility of listening to our body from the inside. So if we talk to science about it, as we know, uh, 10 years, 15 years ago, somebody would tell you that if you are listening to your stomach, there is nothing to be listened to. And now they tell you that actually there is cells of the brain that are um, in living in your stomach. So yes, the stomach is listening, it's connecting to the brain. So the whole description of the systems that interact and have an impact um, is under re-evaluation. And I think that uh, art and artists are part of this process, that is a collective process that's happening in many, in many ways, but by no means uh, this is a trend or this is just one lateral part um, of what needs to be done. And in that sense, it's fundamental um, to really talk and address it um, and try to produce a different re how can I call it, a different bonding and a different mutuality because this idea of mutuality is not only about connection and feeling good together, doing things together. This mutuality is also to discover new spaces that we have no idea about. So uh, what we are when we are together in a mutual symbiosis is a complete different thing than what we are together as an individual defined in a complete closed uh, circuit. So we talk about non-binarism, we are talking about transition when we talk about gender and we talk about fluidity. So we use all these metaphors, but at the end, they are 
they are going to stop being metaphors, perhaps in 100 years, and then they become a new reality. But it's part of the human process to start in a very primordial, in a very, uh, let's say, unimpressive way, uh, till it becomes um, a new world. You, can you have all microphones open? Is that possible? Cool. Um, as we're entering into a conversation, please feel free to jump in and ask questions or contribute to thoughts, um, whatever you want to. But um, as we, as we, what we've described now are spaces, their processes, their approaches, their performances, right? Um, but now we are. Let's talk about objects for a second, no? Now that we are at an art fair, the embassy of objects, um, what role can artworks and objects play in, this, in these processes, in these spaces that you've described? The, the project has transitioned from a non-object-based um, first fellowship to a fellowship that had as an outcome a, uh, uh, an exhibition which you're curating on an exhibition cycle which you're curating and you've been asked from the beginning to think about an exhibition as one of the outcomes. So let's talk about the importance of the object and the role of an artwork in this conversation, in these spaces, processes that we're creating. Because of, because of our training and because of the form of our bodies, a very important element of perception and understanding of the world is morphology. So the objects have a fundamental role because they defy the morphology as we know it. So in order to become a different human, we need to re-understand the relationships that we have in our own body as a form. So we have the head here and the hands here. So the head is more important because it controls the hands moving. We have things inside that they are less important than the things outside because the perception in the outside plays a fundamental role in questions of power, while the inside, it just works for the outside to happen. So all these descriptions have been fundamental in, in 500, 600 years. So objects do play a fundamental role because they may release a complete different morphology. Artists are also activating new technologies and new ideas about materials. And materials may change form, but also artists are telling us that materials have memory and materials have ways of perceiving. So, as I said, all these things are very important for our really rocky bodies. Mm. So we need this type of challenge that we perhaps understand in a very slow way, as Barbara is very well pointing, but we understand it. I think we may not even understand it in this generation, but our non-understanding, our dumbness gets uh, inherent and it gets transformed in inheritance. Mm. So there is a hope and a chance for the next generation. Mm. So in that sense, um, the, the, the pedagogical, experiential dimension of objects cannot be undermined. I, just to go back t for mm -hmm. a second to the work we've seen and we're seeing <coughs> actually for the first time. So thank you also Rosella for sharing this. It's, it's quite incredible how one object, which doesn't even really has a shape. I mean, it's correct, it's not a block. It's just a piece, as is often the case when we're describing artworks, mm -hmm. it's a piece. Uh, so how the disappearance of this object somehow makes so many other things visible how by submerging this object in another space, which is the liquid space of the sea, then all the relations between the things around its disappearance are starting to emerge. How do we see geology? How can we talk about, I mean, one piece going to the bottom of the sea in a place which is over 100, 1,700 meters deep? and it will touch sediments that have been there untouched for millennia, for eras, for and so forth. How can we just use one object as the pointer to the relation, I mean, connecting the extractive 
gas and oil industry to migration routes and how does it connect to archaeology and how archaeology is often exploited to create narratives that are then very well I mean, supportive towards other extractive logics and so forth. I mean, to me, that's the role of this object. And, and also the fact that Rossella correctly <laughs> kept using the word performance. What is this object performing? It's not only because it's been developed for the Kunstfestival des Arts in Brussels, who decided to take this action as a performance, and also supported by a local uh, exhibition space in Malta, which is Blitz, <laughs> also trying its best to build this work together. But it's, it's what we demand from the object. And I it's mean, it's what, what does it generate in terms yeah. of waves? <laughs> and what can we understand from the, the fact of moving that object from one space to the other? And, and we're here describing all the implications, and it's a story. And it's the storytelling which comes with it that may help, I don't know, people who have very limited understanding of what a condition of the scene that space might be, to immediately relate with it. And then to help scientists who are studying Tama, the turtle, who moves from here to there to there to there. I mean. Yesterday but we were in Sardinia and discovered that to Sardinia there are oceanic turtles coming together with Mediterranean turtles and the entire geography of how things move across space changes. I think... But it's so interesting what you are saying because in the second expedition we had Diva Amon and then she was describing, she's an incredible expert in the deep sea and she was showing us an image of a vehicle that was measuring um, the, you know, the depth. And then um, she so showed us light of, of the trace of one of these vehicles that they sent uh, down the sea uh, to take measures. And then she said this image was taken 25 years ago. So the trace is from, let's say, six months ago. So uh, the sea down there is impressively slow. And then she said, when I showed that in a conference against extraction, against going into touching the deep sea, because the way that the deep sea recovers and the way that it preserves is still so unknown that we may produce a damage that we can really not estimate, um, nobody understands what I'm talking about. Mm. And that's exactly where uh, this artistic sensitivity enters because uh, Rosetta does understand, we do understand what it means to touch, to make that marble of Michelangelo touch mm. the ground of the deep sea. We know what, what it means and also the reverberation that it has. But, um, you know, she tried to make a point in that conference. She said, she said it was the most frustrating moment of her life uh, to just make a claim that if, for example, you use the gas coming uh, out of the bent tiles of the planet, there is no, um, I think there is no theory to say what are the damage that this may produce, or if you just go with these machines down there, uh, what are the, the impact, the negative impact of, of all of that, because these people think that they just can do whatever they want, and then it, everything happens in real time. It's synchronized with their will. And this, this, this desynchronization of the human will with the Earth will, is fundamental mm. because modernity did make an effort to synchronize it. Everything we want, we can have it. Yeah. And then if we work together collectively, we can just possess and extract. And this may happen now. And now it's extended through history. It's a history of nows. Mm. And that's what science is saying is that not, it's really not a history of nows. Mm. And, and then you need to create an imagination of the disentanglement of uh, the doing we and, and the doing on a, of Earth. Yeah. So that's, I think, it's, it's really, really important. Also for science, I think she was, and she will be um, observing this performance and these elements and totally agreeing that this is exactly the way to go. Mm. Yeah, Marcella, I think that, oh. Sorry, yeah. I was, would you like to jump in? Because we've, we've been talking about your work, but <laughs> because <laughs> of the technicalities. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to add something to? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Just to point out uh, this, uh, 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 what we were saying about the impact, uh, which we can extend to the idea of the impact of, of the heart in general. And it's, it's uh, of course, something that I always ask myself uh, while produce something. And also when you were talking about the expedition. So how do you, how do you deal with the fact that you have a motorboat uh, traveling through the sea? And is of course, is artist research, you do it with a certain consciousness. But, uh, and I think it's kind of uh, very important to be aware, to be aware of uh, the extraction of the marble to really, um, I mean, to really be there and uh, be there inside and outside. And, uh, uh, there is another thing, so a bit anecdotal, that came to my mind after all this trip. Uh, so going through the, sorry, I have a lot of echo, but going through the whole research and going through the mapping and the, the, the dropping of this block of marble in the water, uh, the first things I did after that it was dropped, I asked her to, be, uh, to go in the water. So they, they put a rope on me and, uh, and a vest and safe vest and I went into the water. And of course, nobody understood, probably not even myself, why? Uh, because they were, Rosella, they were saying, Rosella is gone. You know, you can't, you can't do anything. You can't film it. You can't look where it went. But it was the idea, I think, that wanted to feel. So after I've been from being in proximity with the sea, then from studying it, then to go through this expedition and release something at sea, it was probably the spontaneous, very impulsive way to go myself inside and reconnect to it. And uh, I do think that uh, somehow for me, art, uh, even if I can say I research a lot, I go through a lot of questions and a lot of process, uh, there is a it can always uh, change direction and it can always include. Uh, so this somehow in the narration of this journey, I like to include the fact that after uh, within this expedition, I went into the sea in the place in which this marble block was coming and maybe eating the, this, uh, uh, this seabed that was formed by a thousand year. Uh, so I was just laying uh, on top of it on the wall, inside of the water. And then the other things that I like to say is like, of course, it's a project uh, in which I have been studied the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean culture and what has been crossing and going through underwater, the side. I have been considering the fact that the sea extends to land. So, of course, it extends to the whole Africa that, uh, that is, we were disrupted by Scirocco and Scirocco, it carries the sand that comes from the Sahara. So it's like you can't, uh, detach these elements and uh, but uh, uh, and also I would like to say that my crew uh, my the uh, the um, the she was uh, the ship was a was from a Maltese company uh, PLO uh, port logistic operation but and the entire crew uh, was Filipinos crew we have been working together uh, for two months in which I uh, I went to Malta and I was with them and uh, I met them, I was with them, we did testing, I went with them to see their normal job uh, with them on ship. And uh, in a way for me, it was very interesting how uh, the journey is not anymore Mediterranean in a strict sense. For me, the journey is uh, the crew that was part of it, is their song, is their food, is their knowledge of the sea. Uh, so also restricting the areas uh, even to what we know as a knowledge of traffic, for example, it also doesn't make sense because there are uh, a lot of people crossing. There are a lot of craft crossing. So I was very happy that they disrupted my idea of the Mediterranean and enriched it. And uh, so they are completely included in this, uh, in the journey and the, the, what the journey, the narration of the journey as a Mediterranean. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yes. Hello. 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 Yes. Yes. Cool. We're back. Um, thank you very much for this. I think it's uh, something that we've learned over the past 10 years is that the sea is all encompassing. No? And um, totally. that, uh, that time is important, even though um, it's being said that it's super urgent to act now. Um, not every 
solution that is presented to us currently is a, is a good solution. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think uh, Truce, you were referring to deep sea mining as well, right? Yeah. As a as now the way to provide all of the metals that are needed to uh, to do an energy transition to electric vehicles. Um, I, I imagine it's just another industry that is being spawned to uh, to create more money uh, and income for some and more trouble and violence for others. Um, we, the three of us, we can talk about this, or the four of us, we can talk about this forever, but we have exactly 10 minutes left. So in case you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. It's the mm -hmm. only way to see. <coughs> no. Um, good. Well, then let's talk a little bit about time. No, because I think this uh, this kind of slowness, um, the the um, the timeline or the 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 kind of concentric time that you're referring to, no, by bringing this body of marble that is ancient back to where it came from, um, is is a completely different um, representation of time and a deep, completely different referral to time than the urgency that we are um, that we are communicated yeah. constantly. So, um, choose. I've been thinking about the fact that sometimes when we talk in this manner, people imagine that one model wants to replace another. And that it seems that now there is ways of thinking that they would completely replace other ways of thinking. And I would say that this is also entirely wrong. So, the, the time that that is related to measurement is never going to disappear anymore because it has been created um, as a tool and this tool for many centuries still will be used. So it's really not about that. So if it, that would be even an, a, a modern way of thinking mm. that there is now a better or different better, uh, a different better otherness mm. that would replace the one that's, uh, that's at work. And this is how modernity function so that you would innovate uh, time and then it's a more innovative way of thinking about uh, non-linear so definitely not but it's it's really about making a space for a coexistence that put pressure and also modifies by osmosis uh, the models that are at work and it means for us uh, more possibilities not only for art and for culture, but even for science. I think even science needs this other time, a uh, time that is described in different ways, and it's existing, scientifically speaking. I think the quantic model of time and the linear model of time are not the same. It's only that you use one for biological purposes, because we are biologically oriented, and you use the other for more mathematical and computational purposes but it's there and indigenous time is probably much closer to the computational time so um, it's, it's really just important to make this kind of families of epistemologies um, coexist together and you would say but how and then I would say by intersectionality at the end of the day, it comes with the idea of even the very simple exercise, talk to your children, talk to your parents. I think the, 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 very, the very incorporation of all these discussions into the school and in, into the elderly um, would already expand our idea of labor. And since our labor time the fact that we need to be productive, we need to be effective in a certain moment of our lives determines everything by just um, making it hybrid and different. It would modify um, our, let's say, uh, capitalistic way of thinking about it. So uh, what I mean is that there is very simple exercises that are combined with very complex processes and by activating them, uh, the difference is in its way. I think, as you said, when we were talking about urgency in so many ways, it's because you wanted to, to produce a signal. It's not really about to producing um, a, like a cause and effect reaction. It's because 
many people felt at the same time that it's now or never because it's our old way of talking. But by the moment that we perceive that many people are engaged, we are also much more relaxed about allowing time to be slower or allowing different times to come in. So we are the practitioners in ourselves of, of these very different models in different uh, moments of our own practice. So, and I think that this is really important because it, it, it applies to everyday life. It applies to conversations. Also, I think that uh, one of the dynamics I've been, and I'm still trying to process because I'm slow, so, uh, is how science is also trying to re-question certain of its own models when it comes to time and the way that time helps us gather data, for instance. So the intersection between, say, scientific ecological knowledge and what is called either local or indigenous uh, mm -hmm. ecological knowledge is coming together in different ways over the last years. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's being recognized that the fact that the possibility of describing a condition of, say, the sea or a given area or the morphology of a forest has been told through generations and stories by the communities living there. So, in fact, how a family of fishermen from the Gulf of Gabes, as Rosella was pointing out, or a Sami family, have a knowledge of that space which really runs across time because the stories have been passed on from generation to another is extremely precise in its own understanding of certain conditions. And often contemporary science has a much shorter perspective. Yeah. So the possibility of, of bringing together these two ways and, and making them uh, join forces, if at all possible, is changing, I'm sure, parts of the narration and also the hierarchies of what we consider science science and what we consider just, I don't know, folkloric traditions. And it's the reshaping of elements like this that put the necessity of listening differently to how the stories are composed and who gets to have a say in them, which I think might yeah. help us move along. And I would just give a very uh, pragmatical example. I think one of the things that shape the cultures of the sea the most is this appearance of a body. So I come from Galicia and as you know, it's a fisherman community. And um, in the families, if a body disappears in the sea, is something that it gets talked about for um, weeks. And there is an incredible um, obsession with the recovery of that body. So this gets never approached in the school. Um, in the school, there is no curricula to talk about, about this practice or about this belief or about this event that happens in the, in the heart life. So by Rosella jumping after the rock, we are kind of having a very... Um, a very similar example of trying to touch the body for a last time or actually make it present even if it disappears in a substance that is different than the earth. So all these systems of uh, relating to a material and relating to the possibility of keeping connected because it's all about that. If the body disappears without us being able to actually properly say goodbye, we just lose the connectiveness. So. By just changing the curricula, imagine a Spain different, like what is a, a kid in a school in a village of 252 people like mine, uh, studying the same curricula, of perhaps uh, a kid in Madrid or in the center of Barcelona, I think. But just changing that curricula and applying some of the conversations and the knowledge that, is, that the elderly or their families bring in that, in that community inside the school, it would help them to connect with the schooling and education. So at the end, it has a practical aim, which is those people should stay motivated in what they do and also be and make a difference in the preservation of those areas. What do you ask them to preserve nature if they never learn in the school to talk about what they uh, value in a kind of private 
way, but institutionally speaking, it has absolutely no presence. So they only learn that the state and the institutions don't value what their lives are doing at home. So just connecting and entangle uh, those elements in a simple manner would, would, would help a lot. I think I'm giving the example of Spain because we are in Madrid, but uh, I can give those examples all over the planet. It's just by small transformations of the inclusion. And that's not indigenous in the sense of far away or, or uh, exotic, but vernacular. Just uh, include what matters to you in everything that you do in order to call it education. Rosella, do you have some uh, closing thoughts or opening thank you, thoughts? <laughs> uh, and thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I just uh, like this idea of uh, of moving, moving in uh, in the sea, moving out of the sea, and uh, this. Uh, maybe I can give also the example of the microphone that to, to really perceive the resonance of these amphorans, uh, the possibility of perceive them was really like to insert the microphone and then let record this environment and then slowly uh, extract it and then uh, feel the transition that was from the inside towards the outside that was the whole uh, the whole sound of the city. And for me, it's like this uh, different way of navigating on top and uh, navigating through maps and uh, n knowing uh, exactly, I'm very sorry, uh, knowing exactly how, how, uh, uh, how to, to really like uh, uh, move uh, in this element, uh, but then maybe uh, not knowing, uh, so moving uh, like inside of this element, but maybe not knowing what is under it. And uh, so all this different knowledge, I, I think it will be nice to be able to connect them in between, uh, in between each other. Well, um, I think talking about connection, uh, one thing uh, becomes very evident when you expose your body to a body of water that is the ocean. It will move you and you feel immediately connected. No? So, um, with that, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for connecting to this kind of thinking. Thank you, Rosella, Chus and Barbara for sharing. Um, and thank you, Arco, for having us. Have a great day. Look at some fabulous art. Listen to it and see what these materials and bodies can tell us. And go us. to the website of the Ocean Archive. <laughs> and then... <laughs> thank you. She can't see it. Gracias.